Thank you very much. Uh, one more time uh, to keynote uh, B Side Singapore. It is uh, such a great thing uh, to be invited to to this event, uh, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conference. Um, this talk is a a bit of a technical look at um, vulnerability research on embedded devices. So it's a, it does cover a little bit of technical content, uh, but it is a, a sort of a technical keynote on on embedded device research. Um, I'm going to talk about a few different things. I'm going to talk about when you're looking at an embedded device, um, what you do with it. Uh, and, and pretty much you start off with getting the firmware for an embedded device. Um, once you've got the firmware, maybe even the source code, that's definitely possible, depending on how they've released it. Um, you want to do vulnerability research and hopefully find some sort of bug to, to exploit. Um, as part of the exploit development, uh, process, you probably don't want to start off writing an exploit on the real device. So you want to emulate that device um, and then sort of develop your exploit within that framework. And then hopefully by the end of it, you've got a working exploit against whatever it might be, whether that's a Soho router, whether that's a NAS, whether that's a security camera, whether that's an NVR, whatever it might be, some, some sort of embedded device. Most embedded devices do look quite similar to each other once you get under the hood. So it's a, you know, these techniques don't just apply to one particular type of embedded device, but, but all devices. So that's what this technical keynote is about. It is about trying to exploit embedded devices and the process that I use and the process that InfoSec, uh, the company that I, 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 I run, um, uses to do sort of vulnerability research and exploit development. So you've been given an embedded device. Uh, you want to sort of find a bug in it. You want to exploit it. What do you do? The first thing you really want to do is look at the firmware. And there are different ways that you can get the firmware. Um, that might be through physically interfacing with the device. Um, that might be through um, downloading the firmware off the vendor website. And that's exactly what I've got here. Uh, this is a sort of a Soho router, a Netgear router. Uh, I've just downloaded it from the internet. Um, a lot of Soho routers actually do provide the firmware available to download. Um, um, so it's, it's very easy to, to get you know, the, the binary images of the software that's running. Um, not all embedded devices do provide firmware over the internet. So security cameras are a good example of that where typically they'll just do automatic updates and not provide publicly available downloads for their firmware, that, that's just the way it goes. A lot of devices are moving across to sort of automatic updates and don't provide firmware for download. But I think Soho routers in particular sort of came from an era where initially sort of they, they didn't do automatic updates. And what the, uh, the vendors did was they sort of made it available that you could download the firmware and then do a manual update yourself and put it on a USB stick or, or do something like that and then press the update button and it would do an update. And so there was a reason that, that vendors did provide download links to the firmware. And that really that idea of providing downloadable firmware has just remained, even though a lot of devices today, Soho routers will do automatic updates and don't actually need a download button, but that, that, they'll still provide it. Um, NAS is another um, embedded device where um, um, what you'll see is that they will provide download links um, very common. Um, NVRs, they'll often provide download links because NVRs want to stay sort of up, up, sort of, they often don't do automatic updates on their own. So, but on this particular case, this is the Netgear Nighthawk um, router version, uh, download link available, and we can just download it over the internet. When we get this, um, this zip file, which is the firmware, um, we just, we can, we can literally just download it with the wget or curl request. And We've got sort of the latest version, the latest firmware, and all the software for that for that router, or you know, if it was another embedded device, another embedded device. But all the software is available for us to look at. And really, one of the first things that we do with a firmware that we once we've got it um, is to run Binwalk on it. And Binwalk pulls out um, all sort of the embedded content inside that firmware, and the very typically it will pull out an embedded file system. Um, that's a very common thing that that Binwalk does and that's really what you want. You want that embedded file system that holds all the system files. And typically for these types of devices, they're going to be running some sort of Linux or Linux variant, um, sort of some cut down Linux embedded system. But you can put, you, know, you will pull out a file system that is readable um, normally and that you can process. So you run binwalk minus C on the sort of the image file that you pulled from that firmware download. 
And this is what you get. You run bin, we, we just unzip that firmware download. It just sorted as a zip. Uh, there's an image file, which is the actual firmware image. We run bin walk on that, on that firmware. And what we see is a few different things, but of particular importance is that last line, that SquashFS file system. That's the embedded file system that stores all the files for this particular router. And you know, some of those files are going to be network services that start. There'll be, you know, um, potentially you can also from this firmware look at the kernel image. If you want to, you can see any customized software that they've got on that file system as well. And if we actually just look at what Binwalk extracts, it extracts that SquashFS file system, which is a very typical compressed file system that's in use by firmware, very typical. Um, we can see that SquashFS root, which Binwalk has extracted, and we see basically a Linux file system. There's, you know, there's, um, there's user, there's, there's lib, uh, there's sbin, all of the standard sort of things that we would expect from an embedded sort of device. Um, there's also some interesting stuff there. There's, you know, that Duma OS that's sort of specific to the embedded world, ROM, um, you know, all, a few different types of things, dub, dub, dub. All of these things are sort of specific to this device. So that's quite interesting to look at. Um, this is from one of those Netgear Nighthawk routers. And if there's a binary that actually sits um, in the firmware and in this firmware, there's this, 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 this binary, this network service effectively, well, it's not a network service, it runs once a day um, via some sort of, sort of cron job basically. Um, and it runs once a day and embedded in this binary, this AWS IoT binary is a hard-coded RSA private key with a hard-coded domain name pointing to an Amazon EC2 image. And what this binary does on this Netgear Nighthawk router is once a day, it communicates out to the sort of the internet and gives statistics about CPU usage, load averages and so forth of the router itself. So. You might not even be aware of it, but you know you, some of these some of these embedded devices that you've got are pulling information from your sort of your system or your network um, to a certain level and pushing it out onto the internet and, and updating these servers. And I presume um, in this particular case, Netgear wants to know if their if their routers are working effectively and and if the sort of um, have they got the appropriate hardware? Are they overloaded and so forth? So it's it's, it's probably useful to the vendor to have this information. Um, but it is interesting that, you know, there's hard-coded domains, probably hard-coded RSA private key, just to sort of communicate to the device, communicate to the internet appropriately, but very interesting nevertheless. Most people don't know that this type of software does run on their, on their equipment. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, embedded firmwares, you'll often see that there's um, backdoor accounts uh, on embedded devices. It's a very standard, um, thing to do to look at the password file or the shadow file of the embedded device that you're looking at. Uh, in this particular case, we're looking at a sort of a unify, um, I think it was a router or maybe a UDM Pro, Universal Dream Machine Pro. Um, but this is a hard-coded password, but it's only for first-time login. So as soon as you log in with this hard-coded password, it will ask you to sort of update your password. So not really a problem, but there's a surprisingly large number of IT devices that have hard-coded passwords that are permanent. Um, sometimes, even if they're not network accessible, if you try to get console access to the device um, and it, it might present you with a login prompt and you, you might need to use some of these hard-coded passwords just to get serial access to the device as well. But hard-coded passwords are a very common feature in embedded devices. Effectively, they're service accounts, I suppose would be one way to describe it. Um, sometimes they're not accessible, sometimes they are, sometimes they lead to sort of useful things to an attacker, or sometimes they're just footholds into sort of gaining more knowledge about the system for reverse engineering. Okay, so that's, you know, some of the, some of the things that we can do with um, um, firmware. Um, you know, we've got our firmware. We probably also want to look at the network services that are starting when our um, our, pro, our, our device starts up. Uh, we don't just want to look at passwords, files and shadow files. We want remote code execution on these devices. So we probably need to look at some network services. And there's, there's a few main approaches that you can use to do uh, vulnerability research, finding bugs, basically. You can do code review. So manually reading the code or reversing the code. 
Uh, you can fuzz test and do dynamic analysis. So basically sending random inputs to the code or the, or the network service binaries or whatever they might be to see if you get a crash or you might want to use static analysis tools. Maybe if you've got the source code or maybe if you've got the firmware, some sort of Ghidra plugin or something like that, or decompile it back to source code and then run your static analysis tools. Sometimes you do have the source code provided in a release, or sometimes you just have the firmware binary, so you better use something like Ghidra and do reverse engineering on it. This is um, a router that I'm gonna look at. Um, I looked at it a couple of years ago when it was the point to own target in 2020. Point to own is sort of an international competition where uh, you basically have competitors trying to sort of um, compromise the latest software in latest software and devices in various things from browsers to cars to Soho routers as well and NASs and a variety of other things. In one of the point to owns in 2020, they had the TP-Link AC1750 smart Wi-Fi router, pretty standard Soho router. And the goal was to get remote code execution on this device from either the local network or over the WAN interface on sort of over, you know, via the internet. Um, now, a lot of these TP-Link routers have this special networking capability. They have this zero configuration network management capability. And the idea of this is that when you sort of add your TP-Link device to your local home network, um, you can just go onto your mobile phone app and it automatically detects that, you know, oh, you've got a new TP-Link device on your network. You want to add this to your, you know, to your, you know, to your save configuration and, and, and be able to manipulate it. And to do this, to, to sort of, to do this automatic discovery and automatic configuration, there's some sort of extra network services that run on TP-Link routers. And this is a pretty good attack surface. Anything customized, anything unique um, is good to, to, to look at for bugs. Now we can just download the firmware for our router, the, the TP-Link AC1750 or whatever it might be. And we can just look at the, the network services, the daemons that implement that zero configuration network management capability. Now the code for these services is closed source. So we don't have the source code to look at but we do have the binaries. Now the daemons were originally written in C. C is a very common language to implement a lot of network services in IoT and embedded devices. And one binary in particular is called TDDP, the TP-Link Device Discovery Protocol, I think if I recall correctly, and it's in user bin, very standard place to put you know, binaries and so forth. So I just decompiled that, that binary using Ghidra to recover the source code from the, you know, and have a look at the source code. Now this source code, the decompilation isn't the original source code. The recovery is good, but it's nowhere near as good as the original. You don't have all the symbols. You don't even have, you don't have comments, of course. Um, sometimes it doesn't all, always work perfectly, but it's good enough. Um, and what I did was I wanted to look at all the pre-authentication parts of the network protocol implemented by this TDDP binary and if it was, if there was a bug in pre-authentication network packet passing or configuration, that's a pretty good place to get remote code execution. So this is um, one of the functions that I decompiled and I, I found, I saw in Ghidra. And really the only thing to note of this function, because you don't have to look at the line by line of this. This is, I can just talk about it at a high level. That's, you know, you don't really need to know the code here and you might not even be able to read it. It is quite small. Um, but this is a function that basically implements um, executing shell commands. It's TDDP exec command is the name of this function. It's sort of added a debug symbol for or debugging information to us. So we actually know what the function is doing. It just basically executes a shell command if you pass to it a, you know, a command as a, as, a, as a string. And this is going to be used later on. This is basically a re-implementation of the system API um, and system is just an API in C and Unix that just executes shell commands. And as part of this um, um, pre-authentication protocol passing of, of sort of this, this zero configuration networking, there's this one special command called command ftest config. Um, so this is pre-authentication. If you basically send a special packet um, with this sort of option to say, I'm going to use this command, then it executes this code. It's, it calls this function. Um, and, and, and so this is a pretty, you know, this is the type of stuff that we want to audit. This is the type of stuff that we want to find bugs in. Anything pre-authentication that does packet passing is a good target to audit. And 
if we look at the function that implements this, this, um, this, this, um, what is it called? I'll just command F test config. That's the sort of the, the, the protocol that it's the, the part of the protocol that's doing. It eventually gets to this point. Again, you don't need to read this code. I'm just going to talk about it, but it's sort of just here for reference. Um, you get to the end and it executes a shell command. Um, and it calls that function that we talked about earlier, that exec command function uh, that executes a shell command. But we're just calling that instead of calling the normal system API, but we're base, we're executing a shell command. And as part of the shell command, it sort of CDs into temp, TFTP something. And as one of the arguments for this um, in the shell command that sort of expands, it uses untrusted input coming across from the network. So as an attacker on the LAN, we can send this untrusted input and get this embedded into this shell command that is executed pre-authentication in this TDTP um, daemon. And what we have is a classic uh, command injection. We can just execute, um, we can just inject a command using shell meta characters and embed an, a command to do whatever we want. We could, you know, we're running as root, um, it's, 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 it's not running as a sort of an unprivileged user, it's running as root, we can inject a shell command and get arbitrary code execution. And under emulation, this bug is entirely legitimate and works as expected, we can emulate it, uh, we can execute arbitrary commands as root from an unauthenticated user on the LAN. So this seems like a great bug. And I, when I found it, I was actually very pleased. I thought, oh, this is, you know, this is a good, you know, RCE as root, um, unauthenticated, uh, it's a good bug and a very good bug to, um, to command injections are always very good because you don't have to worry about um, the reliability of memory corruption. Uh, command injections are typically going to be much more reliable. The problem is that this um, service, the TDTP protocol only seems to be enabled in factory mode. So after it's been sort of freshly installed or, or freshly delivered to the customer, um, you have this service running. So, I mean, and it's not always in factory mode. So it's not necessarily the case that it is default configuration. Um, so that's not very good. So the daemon only runs in factory mode setting. So it's a vulnerability, but it's not default. And even more interesting or sort of maybe it's concerning or maybe it's interesting depending on your point of view it turns out this tdp but tddp bug that i found that i thought was a zero day wasn't even a zero day it's known about um in fact there's a there's a blog post by um a guy um who talks about the tp link sr20 a different router and he documents this exact bug um and it's just it's exactly the same bug in the, exactly the same service and it just turns out, and they've patched this on a you know a, you know a bunch of devices, but it just turns out that many routers have been patched as a result of this blog post, um, but not all routers. They haven't ported it to all the routers in their product line that have this service running. So, not even a zero day. It's sort of terrible, I think. Um, but if you look a little bit deeper into the sort of the services that are starting up, there's this weird thing in the sort of the, the initialization of, of this network services as, as the sort of the device boots, there's this call. Um, it basically downloads this file off a hard coded IP address on your network. And then later on it executes it. So it, it's an auto calibration shell script or something like that. I don't, I don't know what it is, auto calibration 2G. It's presumably some sort of development backdoor just to sort of help development and, and sort of debug it. Uh, but it downloads with this hard-coded IP address and executes this shell script. Um, so there's, there's a, it's a backdoor. But the developer backdoor seems to be only enabled when the TDDP daemon is enabled as well, uh, which seems to be after a, a factory reset. So this is, I mean, is it a zero day? I mean, if it, if it was, having such constraints on, on your bugs isn't very good. And really the solution is just to find better bugs. That's really the solution. There, there's better bugs out there. Um, almost all of these devices do have more bugs that you can find. So you just got, you've just got to look harder. Okay, so let's say that we've got a bug and we'll talk about some, some zero, sort, sort of bugs later on. But uh, let's, you know, once we found our bug, you know, assuming our VR process did actually come up with something useful, 
uh, and we want to write an exploit, the typical thing that we do is emulate our, our device. We don't want to sort of develop an exploit on the real device unless we have to. Uh, we would prefer to emulate it so that we can sort of test out our exploitation with our full normal tool chains that we use on our host device um, at a sort of a reasonable speed. Embedded devices are probably low power or much more lower power than or less performant than our, than our host machines. So, I mean, you know, it would be nice to emulate it if we can. So we're assuming that you've downloaded the firmware or you've acquired the firmware through physical interfacing or, or intercepted web traffic to sort of a person in the middle, a sort of a firmware download or firmware update. So you've got the firmware and you were assuming that you've sort of extracted the root file system from the firmware using Binwalk or some other mechanism. And, and it's also a Linux based device, which is very, very likely for a sort of sort of most IT devices today. Now, the first step we want to emulate it, um, you know, is to sort of, you know, we've got the we've got firmware binaries. What is the architecture? Um, you know, what architecture should we emulate it with? It could be ARM, it could be MIPS, it could be x86. ARM and MIPS are probably very common. Um, ARM is the most common, I would say. MIPS is still out there. Um, actually, MIPS, um, if, you, if your Soho router at home or your embedded device is running MIPS, um, only in recent, only in the recent couple of years has a Linux kernel actually implemented non-executable stack a non-executable stack for the MIPS architecture. And in all likelihood, your router or your embedded device is using an old kernel. Most embedded devices don't use the latest kernels. And so probably, you know, when you think about like, you know, old school stack smashing exploits, you know, with executable stacks, that's probably the case for your for, for some of these, for some of these embedded devices that you will see on a sort of a, a you know on a regular basis. Um, so I mean you know, some of these bugs, you know, Use, can be exploited using sort of old school techniques. But ARM and MIPS have multiple sort of architectures, the variants of those architectures. So you need to determine that as well if you're, if you're trying to emulate it. You can run file, which is sort of tells you, identify sort of magic byte sequences in the binary to identify the file type. And you can determine the architecture based on that. You can run read elf, um, which gives you the elf headers. Um, and you can actually use, um, get the, all the headers with the minus A lowercase or minus capital A to get the architecture information. These are some ways that you can determine the architecture of your, of your binary. Um, and so we're just running file on, on this web service uh, and it says it's an ARM binary. It's 32 bit, 32 bit is still very common in, in embedded, um, uh, especially for lot, sort of your Soho style devices, th th 32 bit is very common. Uh, we look at the architecture, we can see it's an executable standard. It's not a Pi binary, position independent and executable. So it doesn't use, it doesn't use all the mitigations that you would have on a standard desktop, very standard. Most of these devices don't use all the mitigations. A lot of them don't even use stack canaries um, for, for their buffers or their stack based buffers. So it's ARM, um, we can see information running read elf. We're gonna use a tool called QMU uh, or quick emulator, everyone calls it QMU. Um, it's a Linux tool that can emulate a variety of architectures, um, including um, you know, ARM, MIPS, x86. We can emulate a whole system, um, boot an OS from a disk. We can emulate user mode applications as well, um, which is a really great thing to do. We don't need to sort of emulate an entire operating system. And for quick testing, I would actually say that user mode emulation is a good place to start. But once you've done that, then go to that whole system emulation and actually run in a, in a proper, you know, an ARM Linux distro so that you can get more information. There are a couple of techniques to do user mode emulation in QMU. Um, you can specify um, um, the root file system, basically using the minus L option. So QMU knows where the firmware libraries are. We can ch root into it and launch a shell. There are a couple of different approaches. I'll show you some examples of this. The minus L basically option specifies the library path to use uh, because your firmware is going to be using its own version of libc, probably uc libc, some in, like a micro libc, embedded libc version, not your standard desktop. And so if you just run, go into your squashfs root that we extracted from binwalk and we downloaded the firmware off, we just run QMU arm minus capital L to say, this is the prefix for our library path. We run bin ls and we're emulating this firmware, this binary, this ls binary uh, under the arm architecture. And that's pretty cool. We just emulated part of our firmware binary. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool, I think, that we can do that. And it's so easy. We just run QMU ARM and we're able to do it. Um, 
So I would recommend at this point, once you verify that you can do user mode emulation, um, just, um, you know, do whole system emulation, uh, get a disk image for a Linux distro that's running ARM or whatever it might be. And you can do port forwarding so that you can SSH into your guest image as well. There are um, a bunch of pre-compiled or pre-built images um, for Debian. Um, you can just download these off the internet. So you've got here, for example, a MIPS Linux distro that you can just emulate in Kumu and you can just download everything. You don't have to build a Debian image yourself. They're old images that you can download, but if you want to build a new one, you can do that as well. And you run QMU with your special, you know, command line options, I suppose, um, specifying the kernel, um, the, the, uh, the RAM disk image that you're going to use. Um, you specify the QCAL, the disk image of, the, of this Debian image that you downloaded, and you're able to emulate an entire system. And now it boots up like a normal Linux distro, except it's running ARM or MIPS or whatever it might be. Uh, and you know, that's a pretty good place to be to emulate binaries. SSH into your, um, your image, your, your guest, and you've got a root shell running ARM. And there's a trick actually to emulating firmware when you've got a, um, a system like this. Um, you know, we've got a, 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 an ARM Linux image now. What we're gonna do is just copy the firmware image, our root file system, our squashfs root into our guest. And we're gonna just ch root into that squash FS root and then run bin SH uh, from our firmware. And that basically gives us a shell, uh, gives us a shell inside our firmware on the native architecture emulated by QMU. So that's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool way of doing it. Um, that's um, whole system emulation. We did user mode emulation to start off with, and then we can just transform to whole system emulation. And now we can just install native tools like GDB and do all of those things that we want to do. Okay, so we've got our bug. Well, if, assuming we found a bug, um, we've got our emulation set up. Now we actually want to go write an exploit. Um, I'll talk about a real zero day now and the exploit development process for it. And I'll give you some background through manual code review. Uh, the vulnerability research process basically just get code review. Um, this process discovered a pre authentication stack based buffer overflow in a web server implementation. And for this device, the attack only requires a single HTTP GET request. And this web interface is enabled by default on the LAN side and it can be enabled on the WAN interface. If you go into Shodan and you start searching for this device, there's probably a bunch of them out there. Now, generally, when you found a bug, the, one of the first things you want to do is just trigger a crash, just, just to see if this it's a real bug or not. Um, I actually did sort of a, a convoluted way of doing this. I actually compiled the source code that I had on it um, with debug symbols. And what I realized that I just needed to have a, you know, an extra header uh, when I did my GET request to trigger the bug which was an important part. This was sort of, you know, getting the sort of a crash to trigger. Um, I needed that referrer header. I also needed a timestamp as part of the GET request. And the timestamp had to be within a couple of minutes of the web server's real time. And initially I thought this was sort of, that, you know, had to, I figured this out and I realized, oh, actually this is a really good thing because it means that if you are fuzz testing this service, you probably wouldn't be able to find a bug like this or reproduce it. So manual code review here found a bug that probably wasn't particularly easy to fuzz or probably wasn't going to be fuzzable because of that timestamp. So that's a good thing. It means this bug is going to be longer lived. Um, so I emulated the real web server under QMU. I've got a raised hand. I'll, I'll keep on going and I'll, I'll I think I'm going to 9.45, I think my time is, but I'll keep on going. Uh, the next step was to emulate the real web server under QMU. Uh, the target architecture is ARM. Um, the firmware did, did use data execution prevention, so I didn't have an executable stack. Uh, it did use ASLR, address space layer randomization. The binary wasn't PI and didn't use stack canaries. Um, so that's a good thing. I mean, that's, that's a pretty good mitigation, stack canaries, but it didn't use it. 
in an ideal world, I would just overwrite the return address with a gadget to move the stack pointer into the argument register and then wrap into system. It's a pretty standard exploitation technique to, to get sort of execute arbitrary shell commands. Um, the tech segment for these gadgets though contained a null byte and can't build a ROP chain since I need these null bytes into a string based buffer overflow. So that's quite problematic. Um, also, there's other problems. On x86, it was a clean return address stack overwrite. And on the real target, the web server crashes before it overwrites the return address. And um, it turns out what happens is that the, the web server does some JSON processing using an application pointer stored on the stack that points to this JSON object. And this application pointer gets corrupted by the exploit that does the buffer overflow. So this is a real problem. Um, now the web server isn't Pi, and in fact the user agent header is stored in a global data address. So we can just create a fake JSON object in this fixed addressable data, and we'll modify modify our exploit to overwrite the corrupt application pointer to to point to our fake JSON object. Our fake JSON object also stores a kind of virtual function table or a V table. So we can hijack control flow by not overriding the stack's return address, but by overriding the vtable function pointer. And the interesting thing about this is that we can also bypass stack canaries if that mitigation was present. Um, we actually have to bypass ASLR as well now. Uh, so we can basically um, use uh, uh, a gadget to pivot our a uh, ROP chain, uh, then we can call system at PLT, we can bypass ASLR in a non-PI binary and our exploit pretty much works um, 100%. Finally, I craft a shell command that echoes a string to a file to generate an executable to connect back to me and I get a root shell. And the exploit is 100% reliable and it would work if stack canaries were used since it doesn't overwrite the return address. Let's look at a router in a different vendor. Let's look at a D-Link router um, and have a look at sort of a working export to see what it looks like. So let's look at it. And this is a D-Link router. This is um, pretty sort of a standard Soho router. I've just connected it over the network um, because uh, um, it's easier than the Wi-Fi for this setup, but the Wi-Fi works as well. I run the exploit. I'm basically, uh, it's a staged exploit. So I'm sort of building up the payload as I go. Um, I'm running it. It does take a few seconds to run. And I've also started a netcat listener on another and it's connected back to me. The, the router now is connected back to me running as root. I should have a shell. And if I run uname minus a, I can actually see a shell, uh, a root shell on this box uh, or well, on this router, got a root shell. And it's a running an old version of Linux as well, but this is a, a Soho router. And the interesting about this router was, um, and I've got other router exploits of course, but um, they've got demos of, but um, for this router, I bought it from our local sort of um, entertain, you know, sort of white, um, sort of electronics entertainment store and so forth. I just bought one off the shelf because I thought that would be, you know, a good example of a router. I took it home and I looked at the firmware and I actually found on the vendor website that this um, that this uh, this router is end of life. It was still being sold at my local store, but it's end of life. And as part of these devices, when it's end of life, they never do firmware updates again. So this exploit is forever present now and will never be patched. And so if you go on the internet and, and you go onto Shodan and sort of look for, um, you know, this router, you can guarantee if, it, if it's out there, then the exploit is, is present, which isn't a great thing for security. I mean, um, a lot of, um, a lot of countries, in fact, have sort of started trying to address sort of IT problems and embedded problems. And, you know, I, I think Australia has a code of practice and they've sort of extended that to other things now. They, they had a code of practice a few years ago uh, where they sort of set set guidelines for IT vendors and, and, and embedded vendors to sort of, and 
the lifetime management of the product was part of that. How do you, you know, how do you delete accounts? How do you, and firmware updates were part of that. Having established, you know, end of life programs and all of these things are big concerns. And the world is only becoming more and more connected to IT devices today. So, um, you know, we haven't solved IT, but, but people are trying to address it. And as the sort of um, different communities in different countries work sort of on this. They're all trying to sort of, they realize it's a problem and are trying to do something about it. I think it will get better over, you know, the next five or so years. But I mean, right now, a lot of these devices are still vulnerable. So that is the end of my keynote. I hope you liked it. It did get a bit technical at, uh, at quite a number of points, um, but I think um, you know, there's, there's, there's insight to be gained from looking at the state of IT security that, that do have vulnerabilities. Uh, we need to make sure that, you know, that we find them, that we address them. Uh, we take, you know, do appropriate things to ensure the security of our networks. To get, sort of build IT zero days, it does take work. It is achievable. And uh, we do have a... a our, our premises in, in, in Australia, and we do run sort of IT training. And this is some of the boxes of routers that we use for our training where we pull them apart and desold the chips and dump firmware and so forth. So thank you very much again for the invite to B-Side Singapore. Um, I'm, uh, it's been a real pleasure. I'm, I'm very honoured that you've invited me and I will take any questions if you've got them. <laughs>